الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد All praise due to Allah We praise Him abundantly the way He deserves to be praised And we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send His blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم It looks like someone is upset Or maybe someone is uh, Apologies for what happened earlier It's beyond us, technical issues uh, uh, going back to our discussion, which inshallah nothing will throw us off because the discussion's importance is beyond any minor obstacles that are thrown in our way. Perhaps it's a test from Allah to see how sincere we are in addressing this issue. And I'll tell you that I'm pretty, pretty sincere about discussing the rights of the creation. The rights that Allah Azza wa Jal had stipulated are two types. The rights of Allah, which we have discussed in the first and second episodes, uh, because the rights of the Prophet Sallallahu are a byproduct of the rights of Allah and then the rights of the creation of Allah. And when we speak about the rights of the creation of Allah, we have a, a pyramid, a hierarchy. Uh, we have a priority list. So the question remains, who is the most important? Whose rights are the most valuable? in terms of the creation of Allah, which include Allah, the creation of Allah includes your relationship with uh, Muslims, your relationship with non-Muslims, your relationship with uh, creatures, animals, cattle, your relationship with nature, your relationship with uh, perhaps jinn, your relationship with anything, everything and anything. And then your family members and then among the family members, of course, the who is most important. So who do you think uh, the rights of which are the most important by definition as per the revelation in the Quran we have a clear cut answer when Allah says وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا then the case is closed amigo and your Lord has declared that, your Lord has declared or decreed sorry that you should worship none but him and to the parents you must be dutiful that tells you about the rights of the parents. But I have a surprise for you. And the surprise is that today's topic is actually addressing the rights of the parents and the rights of the children. So I'm going to twist it, twist it and I'm going to shuffle the whole subject matter. I'm going to begin with the rights of the children first. So I can give some tips to the Muslims, the parents, and then afterwards we will explain now that the children understand and now that the parents understand both the children and the parents understand what effort the parents have to put towards them that makes them worthy of being dutiful to that their children are dutiful to them in fact even if the parents fail in every respect about what i will mention right now still as we will see from the quran and the sunnah the children have an obligation to be dutiful to your parents Accordingly. All right. So let us understand some principles first. The first principle is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, wherein he said, "Kullukum ra'in, wa kullukum mas'ulun al ra'iyatih." Each and every one of you is a shepherd, and he is in charge of the inhabitants or or his uh, uh, herd. He is in charge of his sheep, quote unquote. And what we mean here, of course, metaphorically is that you are in charge of those who are under your care. Then the Prophet ﷺ gave examples. So the man, the man is a shepherd in charge of his inhabitants of this household, and he is responsible for his flock. And a woman is a shepherdess in charge of her husband's house and children, and she is responsible for them, and so on and so forth. So the first fundamental principle is that we are responsible for our children. In fact, our children are a deciding factor on our end result and our destination. Meaning, depending on how we raise our children, either we are earning a ticket to enter paradise, or we might be possibly earning a ticket to enter the hellfire or the billah, depending on how we raise our children. If that's not highlighting well enough how important the subject is, then what would do the job? If our Jannah and Nar are pretty much dependent on those children, 
then you know that this is a serious, serious matter. Our children, as Allah says, وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ أَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ And know that your properties and your children are but a trial. And that Allah, and with Allah, uh, has, Allah has a great reward. With Him is a great reward. This means that our children are a fitna. Al-malu wal banun zinatul hayat dunya The wealth and children are the adornment of this worldly life. So depending on how we deal with this trial, we will either be saved or we will be destroyed and we seek refuge with Allah Azza wa from destruction. If this is understood, then the question remains, what is the reality of raising our children? What are the things we are supposed to do? What are the expectations? What are some parenting tips? And how do we deal with defiant children? How do we deal with disobedient children? Before we delve into this, there are some basics that we must cover. The first of which is understanding the concept of fitra. And for you to understand the concept of fitra, you have to understand the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he said, Kullu mawludun yuladu ala al-fitra. Every child is born upon fitra. Fitra means Islam. And then it is his parents who make him Jewish, Christian, or Magian. As an animal produces a perfect young animal. Do you see any part of its body amputated? This hadith affirms two fundamental truths. Firstly, that children are born with the inclination to recognize and worship Allah alone. That is already built in. It's in the DNA. It's in the CPU. It's in the core of the human heart and mind. And that is why any human being on earth who ignores the truth and claims that he did not know that Allah deserves to be worshipped after the truth has been presented to them is a bluffer. He is a bluffer. And so, if one were to claim that I didn't know, we say you knew because Allah created you in this way to begin with. What is important here, the second part is that they come under the influence of the parents who will either nurture that inclination, that fitra of tawheed, or teach them to reject it. So now that the child is born upon this fitra, it is the parents who will either nurture it or they will teach him to reject it. Hence, in Islam, parents shoulder the primary responsibility for providing their children the optimal means to strengthen and maintain their faith. Meaning Allah gave it to them. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is on us to nurture it. And so when a child is born upon the fitrah, his environment actually dictates what they wind up believing. And if a child were to go astray, then the parents, before blaming the child, have to first look into themselves, look into their history and see what have they been uh, uh, providing or not providing to this child that allowed him or her to reach this poor, a point in deviance. Let us discuss some adverse effects on faith. What are the things that are against the nurturing that the children need and how does that affect their iman? There are cases which affect the child's faith. First, when one or both parents barely practice Islam. It is very difficult, it happens, but it's very rare that you find a child that is practicing and both of his parents are uh, misguided. And then it's also more challenging when one of the parents is misguided. So it is important then that both parents are upon the truth. That means that uh, the spouse selection process is fundamental. And in the stage of after marriage, that means that there has to be collaboration and enjoying the good and forbidding the evil between the parents, meaning self-rectification, but going both ways 
so that both parents can be at that level to be able to nurture the child. So if the mother sees that the father is not at that level, then she has to be there to remind him, advise him in a kind and, and intelligent way. And vice versa. If the husband sees his wife is not on the track, he has to help her get back on track. There has to be this mutual cooperation between the parents so that the child is not victimized. The second situation is uh, when one or both parents are not active in instilling that faith in the child. Meaning only one of the parents is making an effort to nurture the children's uh, faith and the other one is in La La Land. And you have to bring him back from La La Land by his neck or by her neck and make sure that they're actively involved because each has a role to play. Thirdly, uh, it's very common, the assumption that the children will just discover faith on their own. You know, a lot of, a lot of parents have this mentality, uh, send them into the world and Allah will guide them. Um, no, it's a cute one, very cute actually. It should be put in a frame and hung over your head. But in real life, you don't do this. If somebody told you that out right now, let's just give you a contemporary example. If someone said that, look, in this supermarket, there's coronavirus everywhere. I want to see you send your child to the supermarket and say, Wallah, we hope and pray that uh, Allah will guide him through the supermarket to come back safe and sound. Excuse me? Yani, yani, if, you, if they told you there's fire outside, would you send them outside to find out whether the fire is going to consume him or not? Uh, absolutely not. So leaving the matter up to the child and hoping that Allah guides them is a form of false tawakkul. Because tawakkul on Allah is that you exert all the means, all the means Allah made available to you and then you pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to guide the child. Not that you leave them to figure things out on your own and think Allah will just guide them just like that. That's just negligence on your part and you have to face it. Fourthly, the assumption that, uh, you know, the halaqa in the masjid or the school that you send them to or the book that he's reading is going to do the job. And you are a, a passive observer. A lot of parents are passive observers. They just watch from a distance. And to make it uh, relevant to us, uh, when we have these camps on annual basis, a lot of parents just think once they send their son on this camp, then the miracles are going to happen in the camp and he's going to come back, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Ala tool. And he will have fun too. Not just he will become Sheikh al-Islam, he will be Sheikh al-Islam and he will become an, uh, an athlete, an optimal athlete. Um, you wait a whole year and you think four or five days is going to fix the problem? No, that's cool. That's cool. That's, it's a great uh, endeavor. It's a great uh, uh, contribution. But the fundamental effort has to come from you the whole year. Around the clock. So just thinking that an establishment of some sort is going to do the job is not going to fly either. And lastly, and one of the most dangerous is prioritizing secular education over Islamic education. Everybody's freaking out and panicking. I want my son to be a doctor, an engineer, an architect, a batikha, a shamama, a, a, you know, an eggplant. You want him to be everything in this world. And you, uh, you teach him all the worldly matters, but then when you ask him about La ilaha illallah, he's like, huh? huh? What? Uh, La ilaha illallah means God. God is there. MashaAllah, what a comprehensive answer. La, that will take you straight to Jannah, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Maisir, ya jama'a, maisir. Maisir, this is not acceptable. We're not gonna, yani. If you're not going to teach them the categories of Tawheed, Rububiyya, and Uluhiyya, and Asma, and Sifat, maybe it's too advanced for them. And there is, by the way, an, uh, uh, a simplified version even for the children. But at the same time, the child has to know what religion he follows. They have to know the basics of the Halal and the Haram. They have to know the rights of Allah. They have to know how to pray, how to make wudu, and the list goes on. So just worrying about their worldly education, which is all right. On the expense of them having zero Islamic education is horrendous. And that's what we see for the most part. Most of the children we come across, illa man rahim Allah, they know everything, mashallah, tabarakallah, about gaming and about Fortnite and about, uh, what I don't know this and this and that and skateboarding and biking and uh, cars and motors and engines and you name it. But they don't know the name of the Sahaba. And all of us parents get surprised sometimes. We assume our children know that more than we think. 
Then when we have a talk with them, Wallahi, I've come to this realization many times with my own children. We realize that, hey, 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 we're, we're, we're tripping. We're falling behind. We thought these kids were, mashallah, on, on the level that we want them to be. You'll be surprised the children forget so much. That's why it requires constant effort. It's a constant effort that you have to put forth. It's not that you teach them uh, the names of the Ashra, the 10 who were given Glatarins of Jannah when they're three years old, and then when he's 15, you think he's going to have them memorized. If we don't actually go over them more than once and revise them, they will forget. They will forget. Bismillah. So you got to keep them in check. That's why we should design programs for the house. Either it is offered by different organizations like Kalima, they have something already set up and then you, you plug in your children and you make sure that they're attending and they're listening and they're part of the whole thing. They're learning. They're actually learning the deen from people that are not, you know, inshallah, giving them false information and inauthentic information and innovations and, uh, you know, fabrications and what have you. People that are teaching them, call Allah, call Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa straightforward, straightforward. Uh, or you, if you're a qualified parent, then you take this uh, task upon yourself and you have some sort of program where you're having fun with your kids. At the same time, and more importantly, you're teaching them the matters of their religion because when they go out to the world and the world right now has come to their laps, that's why it's called a laptop because you put it on top of your lap. And now the whole world is within reach. Back in the day, if someone wanted to, uh, had an interest about atheism, and they wanted to inquire about it, I wonder what they would do. Yani, even at the time when phones were already invented. What is he called? Uh, 411? You know, if you live in the States, you know what 411 is. Uh, hello, uh, can I speak to uh, someone who knows about atheism? And then a person that comes up, well, hello, sir. Well, let me tell you about atheism. Atheism is a great way of life. How would they know about atheism? They go walk down the street. Hey, excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Sir, over there. Are you an atheist? I would like to have a conversation with you. They actually didn't have the means to find out. Are they going to go buy a book? They're going to go buy a book. And you probably will find a book. Nowadays, tick, 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 tick. if they know how to type, and they probably know how to type better than me and you, boom, and now they got a world of information. Encyclopedia worth of information within their fingertips to learn about every deviation in the world. And usually you're not right there next to them when they're using their laptops or their PCs or their phones. You don't see the parent right next to their child. This is the phone like, hey, can I see what you're seeing? I mean, you might do this for one minute per day. For the most part, they are on their own. So you got to be very careful if we don't if we don't manage this then when they go out to the world they're going to be slapped left and right. And if we don't have the right foundation for them then we risk the the chance of them going astray and we cannot afford that. We cannot afford it. So the first tip I want to give the parents myself being a parent first and the rest of you is dua. Never underestimate the power of the dua. Remember what Zakaria said. قَالَ رَبِّ هَبْلِي مِنْ لَدُونْكَ ذُرِّيَّةً طَيِّبَةً إِنَّكَ سَمِيعُ الدُّعَى My Lord, grant me from yourself a good offspring. Indeed, you are the hearer of supplication. We have many occasions in the Quran, like Ibrahim السلام, also asking Allah for a righteous child. So dua is of fundamental importance. Before they come into existence, and after they come into existence, we should often, and we all have the shortcoming, we should make dua for our children abundantly. Allah is the hearer of supplications and Allah controls the hearts of the people. We should make abundance of dua. Don't underestimate it. The Prophet ﷺ used to always grab al Hassan Hussein and say to them, and say, من كل شيطان وهامة ومن كل عين لامة أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم I seek refuge for both of you in the perfect words of Allah from every devil and every poisonous thing and from the evil eye which influences He would then say your father sought refuge to Allah by them for Ismail and Ishaq as in Ibrahim Ibrahim used to make this dua for Ismail and Ishaq 
and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made this dua for Al-Hasan and Al-Husayn radiyallahu anhuma wa ardahuma. And look how beautiful is this dua. Asking Allah azza wa to protect them and to, to take care of them from evil of every type and every nature. Seeking refuge with the words of Allah which, which are not created. So you're seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us actually make this dua? Raise your hand if you have. And if you can't raise your hand, then hello. It's time to introduce it. Secondly, uh, inculcating love of Allah, nurture faith from birth. We have to explain to them often the mercy of Allah. I personally find children are fascinated with the idea that Allah Azza wa Jal is most merciful. They are fascinated with the idea that Allah is most merciful and they're fascinated with the idea that all, the Jannah that Allah has prepared for the, for the believers. Because it allows them to expand their imagination. I've tried it with my kids. We sit down and we tell them, in Jannah you can have whatever you want. And they, it tickles their minds. They start thinking, really? So if I want to have the car and go with the ish, or have a horse that flies and I want to swim and be dry at the same time and they start coming up with the thoughts that you never thought a human thinks about. It's, it's something that is captivating. And yes, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدَ Allah says they will have whatever they will, whatever they wish for. We have many ayat and hadith that support that you will have in Jannah whatever you ask for. So tell them about Jannah, tell, have them have it in, uh, something to aspire to, and, and a motivation, and let them understand the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the punishment of Allah. Not, we don't also want to be unfair, just mention the mercy of Allah, the mercy of Allah, until they become negligent. There has to be the balance. But it's about, uh, uh, it's about supporting and nurturing the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then also, uh, doing so with the Prophet's uh, traits alayhi salam, which we discussed in the previous episode, teaching him who the Prophet ﷺ is and how to emulate him and how to be like him to the best of our abilities. Uh, fourthly, having the role models to be the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. We should introduce the life of the Sahaba to our children because you will discover if you have a conversation with them that they know about many different, who's the, you know, the biggest YouTuber and the biggest live streamer and the biggest uh, life beamer and the, the biggest Mish'arif Ish. But they don't know uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar and Uthman and Ali and others among the Sahaba. Even though their lives were examples uh, to be followed, they exemplified submission to Allah. They had all the traits that you would want to have in a human being. And because they're not prophets, it makes it something that is actually achievable. Because the Prophet ﷺ was upon a character that we strive so hard to emulate, but he's the messenger of Allah. The Sahaba were not messengers, they were not prophets. But look how close they came in loving and emulating the Prophet ﷺ. So that should be an example for us. Uh, fifthly, uh, as I mentioned, knowledge, you have to teach your children the proper aqidah. Because the false aqidah is prevalent everywhere. And if they don't know exactly who they're worshipping and certain misconceptions and how to you know, refute them, then the children might get confused at some point in time. That's why it is recommended that you learn the proper aqidah, you teach it to your children, and you also know how to answer misconceptions. You don't want to be a flimsy believer where in any time someone tells you something, you give up. And you say, oh wait, I'm not sure, I need to this, I need to check, I need to ask. No, learn how to also defend your faith. Learn how to defend your faith, learn how to stand up for it, how to be brave about it, how to be confident about it. And you can only do so by acquiring knowledge. And let's be honest, we have plenty of time to acquire knowledge. Tayyip, uh, I wanted to really elaborate on this longer, but the time is not going to allow me because I also want to discuss the rights of the parents and I think we lost some time with the... Uh, with the uh, cutting of the stream but let me just give you a brief I want you when you get the chance to go to Surah Luqman and read Ayat 13 to 18 because Luqman gives this child one of the most important pieces of advice that we need and it's from the book of Allah so it cannot be any better than this because Luqman will give you the breakdown of importance of things beginning by telling his son 
يا بني لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم. My son, do not associate partners with Allah. Because verily, associating anything with Allah is great injustice. That is the fundamental principle in Islam. Learning Tawheed. Then you have to teach him about the rights of the parents. As Allah says, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَلِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتُهُ أُمُّ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَلِدَيْكَ أَلَيَّ مَصِيرٌ Then Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned about the, the difficulty that the mother has gone through and he enjoined dutifulness to the parents. Then you have to teach him how to be grateful. أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَلِدَيْكَ Be grateful to me and your parents. To me is your final destination. Then you teach them that Allah is aware of all good deeds and bad deeds. يَا بُنَيَّ إِنَّهَا أَن تَكُمْ مِثْقَالَ الْحَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ فَتَكُمْ فِي سَخْرَةٍ أَوْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ أَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَأْتِ بِهَا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَطِيفٌ خَبِيرٌ Oh my son, indeed, if wrong should be the weight of a mustard seed and should be within a rock or anywhere in the heavens or in the earth, Allah will bring it forth. Indeed, Allah is subtle and acquainted. So always bring to mind that even if they try to trick you or cheat you, that Allah Azza wa Jal knows what they hide. We need to create that awareness in them that Allah Azza wa Jal is watching them and observing them and He's well acquainted with what they do. Then you teach your children how to establish the salah and be patient. Ya Bunayya, aqim is salah. My son, establish the salah. Wa'mur bil ma'roof and enjoin what is good. Wanha an al munkar and forbid what is evil. Wanha an al munkar, forbid what is evil. Wasbir ala ma asabak and be patient concerning that which will afflict you. إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ This is of the matters requiring determination. So you tell your son to establish salah and join what is good, forbid what is evil. That alone is one of the most valuable pieces of advice. Because it's not just about self-rectification, it's about the rectification of the ummah. It's about the rectification of mankind. So you have an obligation to, to save yourself and then that's not enough. And joining the good and forbidding the evil is not with yourself. You do this with others. You have to do it with others. That means there's da'wah involved. That's da'wah right there. So he's instructing his son to be a righteous believer, a righteous worshiper, who's inviting others to this as well. Then he goes on to tell him about some of the etiquettes of not being boastful, not being arrogant, not being proud, and how to walk on earth humbly, and so on and so forth. So the advice of Luqman, if you read it with the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, I think it will be very beneficial for us and brothers and sisters, I know that a lot of you know this. I know that you know this. But again, a dhikra, reminder, is to remind you of what you already know. It's not about discovering information يعني, all the time. Sometimes you discover new information. But it's actually about being reminded of what you already know. However, you have fallen short in implementing it. Therefore, a reminder comes and gives you that rejuvenating catalyst element that allows you to act upon it again. That's it. And who doesn't need this reminder? Everybody, everybody needs it. فَإِنَّ Verily the reminder benefits the believers. Type. Now parents, now that I've told us about what we need to do towards our children, now I have to direct the speech to the children. The children need to understand one thing. There are two scenarios. The first of which is where your parents... Let me just make sure this is muted. The first of which is your parents are actually doing everything I mentioned earlier. Their right now is quadruple. Is multiplied a hundred times fold. Not quadruple, a hundred times fold. But one says, yeah, yeah, nice talk, man. But my parents are nothing like you described. In fact, my parents gave me a horrible name. They didn't raise, the, raise me Islamically. They're negligent. They're busy with their own lives. My father was never around. My mother left, uh, left me for the maid to raise me. She was too busy, uh, you know, uh, trying to be the chef of the century. Spent half of her life in the kitchen making failed dishes. And the list goes on and on and on. So, معلش, يعني, cut me some slack here. I, I have nothing for my parents. I, 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 they, don't, I don't, they don't owe me anything. I don't owe them anything. I'm sorry. I don't owe them anything and I'm not going to give them anything. We say, hold your horses, buddy. If your parents were to be the worst people upon earth, 
they still have a right upon you. Surprise. If your parents were to be the worst people upon earth, they still have a right upon you. So let us discuss this objectively and not subjectively. Don't look at the special cases. Let's speak in general. Let's understand what position the parents hold in your life. First of all, it is the best deed before Allah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ibn Mas'ud asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what deed is most beloved to Allah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said being dutiful to parents. And the hadith is a Bukhari, a Muslim. The greatest deed, in one of the narrations, there are many narrations, one of the narrations, the greatest deed before Allah is birrul walidain. Birrul walidain, the word bir and walidain. Walidain is for the dual, meaning father and mother, the parents. Bir is when you go, when you have overall comprehensive level of excellence. When you are excellent in every respect at all times around the clock. When you make every effort to make sure that you're on top of the game. That is called, excuse me, that is called bir. So being dutiful to your parents is a non-stop, continuous effort to be in the best state of behavior with your parents. That's a big deal. Now, we explained the ayah earlier that Allah says that He decreed that you should worship none but Him and that you should be dutiful to your parents. You have to have that ihsan with your parents. Now, there are many other narrations which I would like to go into, but I honestly don't want to be redundant too much. I will direct you, however, to watch my lecture on YouTube titled, So In Them, Do Struggle. So In Them, Do Struggle. It's a whole lecture that, that mentions all I was able to compile of the authentic narrations from the Prophet ﷺ along with the relevant ayat from the Quran about the rights of the parents. And believe me, believe me, they are so, so many. If I were to go over them all, we would be here till tomorrow. Uh, but enough said for now. That first Allah Azza wa Jal gave him that fundamental right and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it the best deed. In another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was telling the Sahaba about the worst deeds. What are the worst deeds? He said, Al-Ishraqu Billah, associating partners with Allah. And then second, he said, Uquq al being undutiful to your parents. So we have one narration that says the best deed is being dutiful to your parents and the worst deed after shirk, which will take you outside of Islam, is being undutiful to your parents. So that tells you how serious the subject matter is. Now, my dear children, in order to answer the misconception about your parents being corrupt individuals, hypothetically, we already know from the Quran, Allah says, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا And if both of them struggle against you. If both of your parents go out of their way and make constant effort so that you may associate and ascribe partners to me. If your parents are calling you to leave Islam, calling you to Christianity, calling you to Hinduism, calling you to Buddhism, calling you to atheism, if your own parents were actually doing the opposite of their job, Allah says, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Do not obey them. Yet he said, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا Yet keep excellent companionship with them in this worldly life. So in spite of them not fulfilling their right, their right, they're not fulfilling your right, their right is preserved by Allah. It does not mean that you will accept their invitation and you will obey them. No, no, no. You will never obey anyone who tells you to disobey Allah. لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience to creation if it entails disobeying the Creator. So when they invite you to the shirk and kufr, then you don't listen. If they invite you to sinfulness and disobedience, you don't listen. But in terms of your relationship with them, you still have to be excellent in your treatment to them. Which means you're never allowed to disrespect your parents. 
at no point are you allowed to disrespect your parents. Subhanallah al azim And that is very important, my young, my young brothers and sisters, the, the shabab and the banat, those who are, are overzealous and on overexcited. If your parents are doing something wrong, you cannot address and rectify this wrong by doing a wrong on your own. You cannot, two wrongs don't make it right. Two wrongs don't make it right. Your parents did something wrong. You act in a disrespectful way. You think Allah is going to bring about any blessing from this transaction. Do you think Allah will bring about any blessing from this transaction where they did something wrong and you retaliated with wrong of your own? La wallah. La wallah, it will not happen. The only time it will happen, Allah will give you the blessing, is when they oppress you. You retaliate with kindness, compassion, love and mercy and zip in your mouth. Then Allah will bring about a rectification for them if Allah has a decree. So the first tip to the children towards the parents is give, uh, get their advice about everything. Learn how to take advice from your parents who are more experienced than you are. I know you think that you are the X generation or what is it now? Z generation, Y generation. I forgot what letter of the alphabet this generation is that was born after the year uh, 2020. I mean 2000, whatever that may be, your parents, trust me, they have a lot of tricks up their sleeve. Halal tricks, halal tricks up their sleeve. They know what's up. Even if the advice they give you is irrelevant, ya yeah, sheikh, take it. Ask for advice. It might be compatible with what you need to do. It may be incompatible with what you do. There's nothing wrong because you make your parents feel important. As opposed to this, no mom, that please, you, you have no idea what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, Sheikh, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, Sheikh. Sometimes you know what you're doing, but take it easy, man. A lot of times you don't. So the safer side is take their advice in spite of you thinking that you are jack of all aces. Is that what they call him? Jack of all aces? Trade of all aces. Jack of all trades. Aces of all jacks. Khalas ya sheikh. Number two, serve them. Serve your parents. Because they served you for a long time. Your mother, man, man, if I were to speak about the rights of the mother and the difficulty she had to go through to bring you into existence, ya miskeen, anta ya miskeen. Ya miskeena. You gave your parents such a hard time, Allah ahdikum, they had to suffer so much for you to remain alive until the age, whatever age you're in right now. Haram, wallah haram. The mother, man, the mother goes through what is unimaginable. If there's one thing that most men praise Allah for more often than anything else is the fact that He made us men. Because I can't fathom what it would be like to be a woman or a mother. Carrying a child in my body, in my womb for nine months, walking around, can't sit, can't lie down, can't turn around, can't jump, can't lump, can't dump, can't do anything. What is this? Dump stuff in the trash or something. Please, don't misunderstand. What kind of, this is, then, then delivery of the child? Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Please, don't, don't push me. I'm not going to listen to you. I know nobody's speaking to me. I'm talking to myself. I'm just assuming some of you want me to go there. I'm not going to go there. Then after childbirth, this child, this, you know, spoiled little, you know, whatever, we don't want to use weird terms. Spoiled child, you know, wants to nurse now and he wants to do this and change diapers and they just defecate on themselves all day and it's your job to clean and your job to... Do. What is this? The child is consuming, mashallah, tabarakallah, is such a high consumption creature. And you, you listening to me, you were once that child. And you know, you would naturally be irritated. Like, what is this annoying thing? But where did we get this from? We were living clean, you know, feces and, and change uh, diapers and bring I don't know what and can't sleep at night. Our whole life is upside down. But subhanAllah, parents love their child in spite of the difficulty that they give them. And each one of you will probably spoil to this degree with some minor exceptions. Now that they're, you're old enough to serve them, you want to be stingy? Uh, give back, man. Thirdly, let things slide. I'm going to let a sip slide right now, Bismillah. 
يا شيخ let it slide what does that slide mean it doesn't mean you go to Toys R Us and you bring a slide and then you let it slide you let you put something on it and you say well brother I let it slide now what let it slide meaning يعني let things go يعني your parents messed up somewhere give them two not one blind give them two blind eyes become blind so what I I didn't see anything did one of you say something wrong to me did one of you oppress me did one of you scream at me unjustly I didn't see it I didn't hear it I didn't see it I didn't hear it that that's let it in the slide not being like an auditor standing there hmm show me all the transactions for the year 2020 how much this and how much that and why did you say this and you said that but I said this and you said that however this last week you said now this week you're saying two years ago you told me when I woke up at 3.13 in the morning that if the monkey jumps from the zoo then you're gonna buy a bus and now you bought a car instead of a bus and it had six wheels but you promised me eight eh sheikh all these details that you confuse my uncle ya baba let it slide ya sheikh khalli walli khalli walli this is if there's one Arabic expression that is not in the proper Arabic language that all the Muslims in the world should learn, should learn. Even if you don't want to learn Arabic, it is Khaliwali, depending on how you want to pronounce it with the Western accent. Khaliwali or Khaliwali. Let it go. That's actually what let it slide means. Khali meaning leave it. Wali meaning go. And if you've ever visited the Gulf, then <laughs> you know Khaliwali very well. <laughs> it's one of my favorite terms. I remember when I first learned when I came to Saudi Arabia. I was like, what? Fourthly, uh, share in what they love. If you know that your parents like something, offer it. Don't be a miserly creature. Fifthly, keep contact with them. Of course, if you live in the same house, that's a given. If they're abroad, if, they're, if you're living somewhere else, always check on your parents. And nowadays, it's a piece of cake. It's a piece of cake. WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, Snapchat, Instagram, most parents are hip now and they use all these platforms and social platforms as well. Good. Good if they're using them for a good reason, use them to keep contact with them. Uh, contact your extended family members as well. Use this to keep the kinship ties. Always share good news with them. Always try to bring a smile on your parents' face. Don't be a source of depression and misery. You, you, you know, the people, the older people get, the more sensitive they are. Grandparents are like grandchildren, by the way. Grandparents, old parents in general, old people are like little kids. They get ultra sensitive and extremely hurt over little things. You have to be mindful of that. You're still young and foolish. But those older people are sensitive. So the older your parents are and the older they get, the more sensitive they are. So try to be a source of positive energy and good news. Stop giving them a hard time and making their life miserable. Uh, give them credit for the, whatever they do. Yani, a lot of children, unfortunately, they don't remember the good. Yani, for instance, if, if let's say for Eid, let's say for 10 years, you, you bring your children or you buy them a nice gift for, for both Eid. Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. One year, you don't, a lot of the children will forget all these 10 years of, of toys and gifts and they will remember that one year where you didn't give them something. And that's not fair. The, the ideal Muslim child, wallahi, let's say, let's say hypothetically, let's say your parent right now looked at you and said, this Eid, I'm getting you nothing. For whatever reason. A good, you know what an actual ideal Muslim answer is from a child, Muslim child answer is, Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Wallahi, no problem. Because I remember, and I will not forget, that you've brought me and you bought me one, two, three, four, five, six over the years. If this time you're unable to, ma fi mushkila, there's no problem. Now, if we were to do this test with a hundred Muslim children, unfortunately, I think a hundred percent, a hundred percent will say, what? Why? What did I do? How come? This is not fair. But... The neighbors, my friends, my cousins, my nieces, my uncles, and Abba, Abba, ah, ah. they tell you 18 stories and they cry for two days in their room and it's like the end of the world and it's like the house. Ya Sheikh, Ya Sheikh, calm me down. Relax. Don't, don't overdo it. Where, where are the Muslim children like this? If we have the hadith that the Prophet told us about, the man went to bring milk for his parents. 
He came back from those who three who stuck behind the rock. You know the hadith. You know the hadith. He came back. They were asleep. That brother stood on his feet the whole night until Fajr. Until the morning carrying the milk. He wouldn't leave in case they woke up and didn't find him. And he wouldn't wake them up because he doesn't want to disturb them. So that when they wake up, they find the milk available. Ya Sheikh! Ya Sheikh! You think he's going to tell the parents, you didn't buy me, you didn't get me, how come this and how come that? Hey. And lastly, as Allah teaches us, وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُ مَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا And say, my Lord, have mercy on them. Make dua for your parents. If you think there's something wrong with them, even though there might be something wrong with you, but if you think there's something wrong with them, no problemo, senor. Make dua for them. Instead of trying to fix them on your own and you're unable to fix them, ask Allah to fix them for you. Make dua. Allah will reply and respond if Allah Azza wa Jal has a decree and problem solved. And if Allah doesn't answer because he wants to test you in some way, you will still get the reward of this dua. You're fulfilling the ayah. The bottom line is for a Muslim household to be ideal, there's a lot of effort that has to be exerted from every member of the family, the father towards his wife and kids, the mother towards her husband and kids, the kids towards their mother, the kids towards their father, the father towards the wife and the husband towards the wife and the wife towards the husband. It's an ongoing transactions around the clock taking place, taking place, taking place. And we should really try to make an effort to use the best manners and to be like the Prophet ﷺ in every respect. And we are all falling short. But imagine if we all behave like the Prophet ﷺ. How would the father treat his children? How would the children treat their father? And since there's no perfection, we're all going to fall short. Then then we should all make an effort. However, at least if we know the basics and the guidelines, then we can apply the guidelines. So I'm addressing all the youth in the Muslim world. Allah's blessings, and according to many ahadith, your, your parents are your Jannah and your Nar also. The concept of the, the Jannah being under the fear of the mother, irrespective of the authenticity of that narration, there are other narrations to the same effect. That your paradise and hell are actually dependent on your parents. Rid Allah bi rid Allah's pleasure is dependent on the pleasure of your parents being pleased with you. Wa ghadabullah and the anger of Allah is dependent and relying upon the anger of your parents. And the one who, who the one whom Allah Azza wa is pleased with is the one who is durable to his parents. This is the one Allah blesses and facilitates and guides, as we have evidences from the Quran. On the flip side. The person that is driving his parents crazy, where does he expect a success from Allah? How do you expect success from Allah when your parents are upset with you? You have no idea how important it is for you to be obedient. You don't remember the Sheikh, one of the Mashaikh, I don't remember his name from, the, from our righteous predecessors. Ya yeah, Sheikh, he was a teacher. He was in his halaqa, he was in his circle of knowledge with his students. Sheikh with a turban and a beard and the whole shebang. Teaching the people. His mother comes and says, go feed the chicken. This is the mother's capacity. In her mind, right now, chicken must be fed. It's non-negotiable. It's not there for you to have a dialogue about and an argument and a discussion and to analyze it and turn it into a debate and you have rebuttals, you rebuttal number one, then you have 10 minutes and Q&A session. This is not an Ahmad Didat debate, Rahimahullah. The Sheikh said, the Sheikh didn't say. The Sheikh left his students, got up like Allah created them, went to the chicken and fed the chicken. This is the Sheikh. Because he understands what he's teaching. He didn't say, Mom, Mom, Mom. This is the modern day uf. Huh? The uf that Allah spoke about in the Quran. Don't say uf to them and don't you say what is uf? I don't say uf. Uf is not in our language. Uf is not in our culture. Uf is any expression where you're not complying. Any non-compliant expression is uf. So, mom 
is off. The sheikh said, mom, chicken. Yeah, mom, chicken, yeah, mom, right now with my students. You embarrassed me, you humiliated me in front of my, my students and blah, 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 blah. Gave her a lecture to his mom so she can go back with a broken heart and cry while she's washing the dishes because her children is such a genius. No, 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 no. The sheikh was a blessed sheikh. Alatul. Fed the chicken, came back, business as usual. This is how we are supposed to behave all the time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know how serious this is? That is Ihsan. That is Birrul Walidan. You say it's difficult. I said, I will say 100% agreed. Hey, wallahi, it's very difficult. But do you think Jannah is cheap? Huh? You think you're going to enter Jannah? Well, you know, what is that type of walk? I don't know what they call it. You know when they have it when someone ding, 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 like uh, on a, and walking in a park in a picnic? You think that's how you're going to go to Jannah? With flowers and butterflies and birds, you know, peeping over your head. Beep, 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 tweet, tweet, tweet. لا يا شيخ. حفة الجنة بالمكاره. There's difficulty. For you to enter Jannah, you have to go through difficulty. And that is one of the daily difficulties. But a human being is trainable. When you train yourself, when you train yourself, you will get there. You will get there. But you need to start. You need to start somewhere. You need to make a, a serious effort to start. Once you start, you will struggle. And you will struggle until it becomes second nature. Wallahi, it will become second nature. Just like driving a car. When you first learn how to drive a car, you know, you're like, ah, oh, you're holding the steering wheel with six hands. Somehow you find four extra hands come out of your chest. To help you hold the steering wheel because of how scared you are. And you're looking at the rear view mirror and the, and the side mirrors. And you even have a new mirror that you invent in your head. Because you want to change lanes. And then two years later. You're having 18 conversations and you're eating two chicken sandwiches. And you're, you know, I don't know what you're doing while you're driving. Somebody says, yeah, Sheikh, well, weren't you two years ago driving with six hands. And now you drive with one finger uh, without even your hands on the steering wheel. You just go like, like this to the steering wheel and it, it, it turns. Say, uh, khalas, I, I, I got used to it. You want to jump in the swimming pool, swimming pool is super cold, and you keep running around the swimming pool, do I go in, do I go in, it's cold. Ah, ah, ah. Once you go into the swimming pool, pull you out. Yalla, atla, la, ma abga atla. I don't want to go out. Right now, khalas, you're stuck in the swimming pool, you became a fish. It's a matter of getting used to it. So you want, you have to start this with your parents. Try it from now. Finish this lecture. Close this, this, this tab of you watching and then go put it into effect right now. Both of you, parents to your children as the advice given early and children to your parents. Go and give them the salutation. How can I be of service to you tonight? And comply with what they say. Let them, let them smile. Put a smile on their face. Let them appreciate. Maybe they'll make a dua for you in the night of Ramadan. And Allah will never make you face difficulty in the ultimate sense. And Allah will decree that you'll be from the people of Jannah and the people who will never be tortured in the hellfire. But you have to start somewhere. You have to start. You have to do some effort. So you promise me. Promise me when we finish this, you will do this. It will become your mode of performance, your mode of behavior. And in spite of the, the shaitan, mind you, the shaitan is not going to make it easy. He's going to create hurdles and conflicts and maybe in the beginning you'll have a lot of clashes so that you can give up on this whole project. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Continue to strive until it becomes second nature and then you will have a harmonious Muslim household in the ultimate sense. And then when you enter Jannah, you will say, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. Wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Alhamdulillah that Allah guided us to this and we would have never been guided had Allah not guided us. You will appreciate it. Ikhwanun ala sururin mutaqabileen. You and your brothers will be on beds, uh, you know, reclining, facing one another. You will see your parents in Jannah and your siblings in Jannah and everybody's having a blast until forever. You want that? It has to start tonight. I hope and pray that you make that effort sincerely. Zakumullah khairan. See you in the next episode, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.